in progress. Great. Okay, welcome everybody. It's so great to see such a big group here today. I'm Nancy Barlow. I am the wellness coordinator for PRO. Um, just Parkinson's Resources of Oregon is a, a local nonprofit organization that has been supporting people impacted by Parkinson's for over 40 years in Oregon and Southwest Washington. We provide services um, of support, wellness, education, and advocacy um, to help improve the quality of life for all of those who are touched by this disease. So today it is an honor um, for us to host Dr. Goldstein for this virtual event. Um, and in case you don't know, he is coming back in March to do the second part in this series. Um, but today I'm going to introduce the person sitting next to me is Jean Donovan, um, and she is going to actually introduce Dr. Goldstein. Um, Jean is a client of ours locally, um, and she actually had the good fortune of being one of Dr. Goldstein's participants in his research. And so through her own experience with dysautonomia um, and her connections, we were able to coordinate and set up this um, really um, educational and exciting series. So I'm going to let Jean take it over and introduce. Thank you. Good afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Goldstein from NIH today. His credentials in dysautonomia research are most impressive, and I hope you'll take the time to Google his name sometime. What I want to emphasize today is not merely his leadership and groundbreaking accomplishments in clinical research, but rather his commitments to spreading the word about dysautonomia, an underrecognized but terribly serious and widespread disorder among people with Parkinson's. As many of us have discovered, this disorder is not a part of the typical medical school or postdoctoral curriculum. As a result, many of our doctors are not familiar with its complexity and its impact on us. Dr. Goldstein is passionate about correcting this gap in knowledge by spreading the word about this disorder. He's gone to great lengths to share his understanding of this disorder with the medical and Parkinson's community. For example, he created an online educational series of 24 videos on dysautonomia designed for clinicians, but available to us all. Furthermore, to supplement that information, he's also written a remarkable 800 plus page book, Principles of Autonomic Medicine, that is readily available to everyone. It's now undergoing its fifth revision. Finally, the simple fact that he's taking time today to speak with us, people with Parkinson's and our caregivers, illustrates his commitment to spreading the word to those of us, us with Parkinson's. Dr. Goldstein, thank you for sharing your passion with us. And I ask you all to please join me in welcoming Dr. Goldstein. Well, thank, thanks, uh, thanks for the that warm introduction, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna get into it uh, by sharing my screen, and you tell me tell me what you see. You see your first slide. Okay, great, and uh, okay, so then I think we can. And do you, do you see the, the, the arrow moving around? Yes. All right, great. Yes. Okay, so I think we can get going. <clears throat> uh, there, I'm going to be giving, I'm going to be giving two talks. Um, the first is on what is the autonomic nervous system and autonomic failure and so forth. And the the second uh, will be more specifically on uh, the Lewy body diseases, especially uh, uh, Parkinson disease, uh, Parkinson's with orthostatic hypotension, pure autonomic failure, um, and uh, uh, that's that's the way I'm I'm thinking of dividing it up. <clears throat> they say that the the first five seconds of a lecture determine whether the students are gonna be paying attention and learn.
Well, I guess I messed that up. All right, we'll forget. Let's go on. Let's go on. All right. Well, the first the first issue is uh, why are dysautonomias hard? And there are, there are several reasons. First, dysautonomias are multidisciplinary. You could go to a cardiologist because you have a blood pressure or heart rate problem. You could go to a neurologist because you have a movement problem, endocrinologist, GI, et cetera, et cetera. And these uh, these these uh, clinicians are not really trained in in uh, in the autonomic nervous system at all. And so if you go to a cardiologist, they're going to look for a heart rhythm problem or heart failure or hypertension. And if you don't have that, then uh, then they're not going to be able to do anything for you. If you go to a neurologist, they'll look for seizures or, or Parkinson's. Uh, but uh, but it, but if you have uh, an autonomic uh, kind of a complaint, uh, they're not going to know what to do. And if you go to an endocrinologist, they'll look for diabetes or thyroid or adrenal problem and so forth. Uh, uh, but dysautonomias are multidisciplinary. And so no particular uh, single uh, 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 clin clinical group is going to be able to deal effectively with the patients. Another reason that dysautonomies are hard is because they're complex. This is uh, a diagram just to show briefly, uh, simply, <laughs> what uh, what happens when you stand up. And you can see it's not so simple. Uh, and there, there's multiple pathways involving multiple variables and uh, some relationships are positive, like in green there, and some are negative and Nobody can make sense of all this complexity. Another reason that dysautonomias are hard is because there are so many different tests, autonomic tests, and, and no institution uh, carries out all these tests. Uh, each, each institution has its own specialty. specialty. Um, uh, and another reason that dysautonomias are hard is because there are it's just hard to pronounce uh, a lot of the words like like dysautonomia or catecholamines, which uh, uh, we're going to be uh, talking about a little bit. And there's so many different abbreviations uh, that you have to be kind of an expert in the field. Uh, you see one of these abbre abbreviations, you don't know what to do. Uh, you're lost for the rest of uh, of the of the encounter. Uh, it's like an alphabet soup. And another reason that dysautonomias are hard is because they're mind-body disorders. The autonomic nervous system acts at the, at the border of the mind and body. And so we're trying to divide up <clears throat> uh, dysautonomias in terms of whether they're, uh, whether they're in the brain, uh, or, you know, psychiatric or, or or in the periphery and uh, and they're organic, it doesn't really help. Uh, and another reason that dysautonomies are hard is because there's little autonomic medicine training and the patient demand, at least in the United States, far outstrips the supply of the, of trained clinicians who are competent and comfortable with uh, with dealing with the patients. So these, are, so these are some of the reasons that dysautonomias are hard. <laughs> well, we're gonna uh, start this, uh, this off with uh, what is the autonomic nervous system? And uh, here's, a, here's a typical uh, textbook uh, diagram of the autonomic nervous system. And I think the first reaction you have to looking at this is uh, this is impossibly complex. Uh, I'm never going to be able to understand it. And I'm going to, and so you sort of zone out. <clears throat> what I'm going to try to do today is present a, a, a concept of the autonomic nervous system that hopefully will be uh, more uh, amenable to, to just uh, acquiring. 
And we're going to start with the Tootsie Roll pop analogy. Um, uh, a Tootsie Roll pop, uh, as you know, has this uh, this uh, crunchy, sweet candy shell, and uh, and uh, inside, what the key to a Tootsie Roll pop is the chewy chocolate center. <clears throat> well, the, the central nervous system is like a Tootsie Roll pop. Uh, the, the, the stick is the, is the spinal cord. It's like a rope of nerves coming out of the brain. And the, the, uh, the candy shell is the, the cortex of the brain. Um, and the, the chewy chocolate center, which is the key to the Tootsie Roll pop, that's the brain stem. So this is a diagram of the central nervous system. You've got the, the cortex, you've got the, the brain stem, and then the spinal cord. And in particular, the, uh, uh, the, the part of the spinal cord that's in the thorax, which is to say the chest or the, or the going down to the lumbar spine where you have your low back pain, that's, uh, uh, that's a key for the autonomic nervous system, as you'll see. Now, notice that there's nothing in here that says autonomic nervous system. That's because the, the, the autonomic nervous system is outside outside the spinal column so here's uh this is the uh, this is the thorax of a of a person who donated his or her body in uh in in netherlands for for research purposes and the person was plasticized and uh here's the spinal column of the person and here are the ribs and here are the spinal nerves and this right here that's the chain of uh of the uh sympathetic uh, nervous system these clumps of uh clumps of of nerve cells are called ganglia <clears throat> this is uh from an autopsy of a patient and you can see the you can see these spinal nerves here and uh, and you can see running perpendicular to the spinal nerves outside the spinal column. This is the uh, this is the sympathetic chain, and here's an example of a sympathetic ganglion. <laughs> so the the uh, the sympathetic nervous system, which is a key part of the autonomic nervous system. Um, it's not part of the central nervous system. It's outside the Tootsie Roll pop. Uh, the autonomic uh, uh, chains can be thought of as like uh, like pearls on a necklace on each side of the the spinal column. Well, what are the, what are the ganglia for? What 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 do you need them? Uh, I, I use the analogy of how how. Uh, how electricity comes to your house. So the you've got this generator plant and uh, and a distribution center and these large high voltage uh, trunk lines, but they don't go to the house. Instead, outside your house, at least in most uh, most neighborhoods, outside your house, there's a uh, there's a utility pole and there's a transformer and what what. What actually goes to your house are these thin, wispy uh, fiber uh, uh, um, wires. Well, by analogy, uh, the the uh, the the ganglia are like the transformer box outside on the utility pole outside your house, and coming from the spinal cord, there are thick rapidly conducting uh, myelinated fibers. In other words, they have a fatty coating that uh, makes them conduct electricity 
or signals quickly. But that's not what goes to the target organs. What goes to the target organs uh, are these thin, wispy, non-myelinated, slow conducting fibers. These are the postganglionic uh, uh, nerves. So uh, the, the ganglion is a key way station. Uh, you've got pre-ganglionic uh, nerves, and then you've got post-ganglionic nerves. And it's the post-ganglionic nerves, by and large, that go to the target organs like the heart. Now, the autonomic nervous system isn't one thing. Uh, so dysautonomia isn't one thing. <clears throat> Instead, the autonomic nervous system has parts. Uh, the English physiologist uh, Langley, about a century ago, uh, named the autonomic nervous system, and he and he thought of the ner the autonomic nervous system as having three parts the enteric nervous system, which is, uh, that's what, that's the, the, the autonomic nerve, nerve cells that are in the gut, in the walls of the gut. Uh, and the parasympathetic nervous system, which is another phrase that Langley invented. Uh, and the sympathetic nervous system, uh, which actually is uh, in historical terms, ancient. Uh, so these were the three components of Langley's autonomic nervous system. And in the early 20th century, the American physiologist, uh, Walter Cannon, added a, a, uh, another part where adrenaline or epinephrine was the key factor. Uh, well, epinephrine is a hormone. It's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a neurotransmitter. Uh, and Cannon taught that the sympathetic nervous system and uh, and the adrenal gland, which is the source of the adrenaline, acted together in emergencies to maintain homeostasis, uh, a word that he invented. Homeostasis basically means that things stay within bounds. Your, your temperature is, is within bounds, your oxygen is within bounds, and so forth. <laughs> so the idea is still out there that the there's a sympathico adrenal system that's activated in emergencies, but now we know that these systems are actually they're on all the time, and uh, in particular this part of the the, the uh, sympathetic nervous system is uh, is responsible for many let's call them housekeeping chores. Uh, uh, that uh, keep the keep uh, factors such as uh, your blood pressure uh, in check. In the a little bit later in the twenty in the early twentieth century, Sir Henry Dale introduced uh, basically a fifth part of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic cholinergic system, uh, which is responsible for for uh, sweating. Now these different components of the autonomic nervous system have their particular chemical messengers. For the parasympathetic nervous system, it's uh, acetylcholine, choline, so cholinergic. And for the, and for the sweating, that's the sympathetic cholinergic system. And also acetylcholine is the chemical messenger. For uh, uh, the sympathetic uh, nervous system, the main a chemical messenger, messenger that's responsible for cardiovascular regulation is uh, norepinephrine. And the, uh, the sympathetic adrenergic system is, uh, is the part of the sympathetic nervous system where adrenaline or epinephrine is the hormone. So there's three chemical messengers of the, of the sympathetic uh, nervous system. I'm going to call this sympathetic noradrenergic system from now on because norepinephrine is the chemical messenger. And uh, for the sympathetic adrenergic system, it's epinephrine or adrenaline. And for the sympathetic cholinergic system, it's acetylcholine, the same chemical messenger as for the parasympathetic nervous system. 
I'm not gonna talk much about the enteric nervous system. It's extremely complex. There are many chemical messengers and nobody really understands uh, how they, how they uh, work together um, in uh, gastrointestinal function. Now, this is kind of an overview of where these autonomic nerves are in the body. Uh, <clears throat> the, main, uh, the main parasympathetic nerve uh, is the vagus nerve, and it comes from the brainstem. It comes from the brainstem. That means it's coming from the, the chewy chocolate center of the Tootsie Roll Pop. Uh, uh, and it's, and the, the, most of the vagus nerve is myelinated. It's got this thick, rapidly conducting, uh, these thick, rapidly conducting fibers. And the postganglionic, wispy, non-myelinated fibers are short. So the 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 vagal postganglionic uh, fibers are uh, are coming from ganglia that are near or inside the target organ. Meanwhile, uh, you've got your uh, sympathetic chain, the pearls on a necklace, and uh, the 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 preganglionic fibers are short. And most of the sympathetic nerves are non-myelinated. They're thin, slow conducting. Uh, this is uh, a sympathetic noradrenergic nerve. So norepinephrine is being released. Here's a sympathetic uh, cholinergic nerve and, uh, and acetylcholine is being released for sweating. Uh, when, it comes to the, when it comes to the adrenal gland, this is special because uh, uh, maybe you can think of fight or flight responses where you you got to get that that adrenaline out quickly. Uh, the uh, the nerve supply goes right through the myelinated nerves go right through the ganglia. They don't they don't synapse. They, there's no transformer there. They go right through and uh, and directly innervate the uh, the adrenal uh, uh, cells that release uh, epinephrine. Uh, you've got parasympathetic nerves at the top, the cranial nerves, and you've got parasympathetic nerves at the bottom, the sacral, uh, the sacral spinal cord. Uh, so you have pelvic nerves and you have the vagus nerve, and those are the two main parasympathetic nerves outside the head. I'm not going to go to the, I'm, I'm gonna, not going to talk about the parasympathetic nerves inside the head. Well, uh, I'm hoping that uh, this is a little bit easier to digest than that original diagram. This is about as complex as we're going to get. <laughs> uh, what are what are dysautonomias? Well, there's a whole there's a whole universe of of dysautonomias. In other words, conditions where uh, a change in function of one or more components of the autonomic nervous system adversely affect health. And I kind of divide up this universe into pediatric, adult, and geriatric, um, geriatric conditions. The pediatric conditions have a lot of genetic load. They're, they're developmental diseases uh, and uh, and often there, there there's a some a mutation, let's say a, a typo in the genetic encyclopedia that causes the disease. In the adult uh, uh, dysautonomias, um, the apparatus is there; uh, it's just not being regulated right. So these are these are disorders of regulation, if you will. And in the geriatric uh, conditions, these are degenerative diseases where the the autonomic nerve fibers are uh, are are degenerating or or die completely. <clears throat> so that's the way I kind of divide up the, the dysautonomies universe, and you can see there's many many forms of of uh, of dysautonomia. So when you say I have a dysautonomia. That's not really very helpful uh, because the clinician has to kind of figure out where in this dysautonomia universe you're actually where you, where you actually are. <clears throat> now, uh, for 
uh, uh, for much of what I'm going to be talking about today and uh, pretty much all of what I'm going to be talking about in the next lecture, we're going to be dealing with the geriatric, uh, the geriatric forms of dysautonomy. And uh, these all involve degeneration uh, and failure of, uh, of one or more components of the autonomic nervous system. And especially, we're going to be talking about a family of diseases that are called synucleinopathies. I told you, the, 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 the autonomic, autonomic medicine is full of these words that are really difficult to pronounce. Uh, synucleinopathies. Uh, uh, in 1997, it was found that, uh, uh, that a family of uh, where Parkinson's was transmitted as an autosomal dominant trait. In other words, half the family had Parkinson's. The, the, the cause was identified and it was a, it was a mutation, a, a, a typo in the genetic encyclopedia for a protein that, that is called alpha-synuclein. Nobody knows what alpha-synuclein does to this day. But it turned out that uh, also in 1997, that uh, Lewy bodies, which are accumulations of junk inside nerve nerve cells, uh, and characteristic of uh, Parkinson's disease, Lewy bodies contain an abundance of alpha synuclein, and it didn't take long before uh, before researchers uh, 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 thought there's a, a family of synucleinopathies. Uh, uh, the most famous one is uh, Parkinson disease. And about 30 or 40 percent of people with Parkinson's have orthostatic hypotension, a fall in blood pressure every time they stand up. There's also uh, dementia with uh, Lewy bodies, and there's kind of an overlap between Parkinson's with dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, and there's another rare disease called pure autonomic failure which we'll be talking about quite a bit next time. Uh, this is uh, a Lewy body disease, but the patients don't have any signs of a brain problem. It's just an autonomic problem. Uh, there's also uh, a, another rare disease called multiple system atrophy, which can look very much like Parkinson's, but it's not a Lewy body disease. It's a synucleinopathy, but the alpha synuclein deposits, instead of being in Lewy bodies, are in uh, glial cells. The glial cells are like helper cells. They're, they're, not, they're not nerve cells, but the brain has more glial cells than, than nerve cells, actually. And uh, MSA is thought to be a, uh, a form of synucleinopathy where uh, <laughs> where the alpha synuclein is deposited in 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 glial cells. So we're going to be talking a lot about these synucleinopathies. They all they all involve failure of the sympathetic nervous system. They all do. So what what are the signs and symptoms of failure? of this part of the autonomic nervous system. This is the part where um, norepinephrine is released from the sympathetic nerve terminals. Remember, these are wispy, slow conducting non-myelinated fibers that are coming from the ganglia. They're not coming from the central nervous system. <clears throat> well, when, uh, whoops, sorry. When you, uh, when these, when these nerve fibers degenerate, or the terminals are gone, <laughs> or you can't make norepinephrine, my goodness, uh, then there are particular signs and symptoms. The symptoms, uh, and I'm going to guess that a lot of you have these symptoms, are uh, orthostatic intolerance. That means you can't tolerate standing still for a long time uh, because you feel like you're going to faint or uh, uh, um, even if you don't think, uh, but you feel like you're lightheaded. Uh, fatigue, 
exercise intolerance. That means you you get short of breath with exercise. You can't you can't tolerate uh, uh, exercise like you used to. Heat intolerance. Uh, postprandial uh, uh, lightheadedness. That in other words, after you eat a big meal. A coat hanger phenomenon where you feel uh, like a Charlie horse in the in the back of your neck or 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 shoulders in a co coat hanger distribution um, that comes on when you're standing for a while, but it goes away when you lie down. That's called coat hanger phenomenon. And there's uh, so there's a there's a bunch of symptoms, and there are a bunch of signs. Symptoms are what people complain about. Signs are what doctors see. So when they when they look at the eyelids of somebody who's got sympathetic failure, uh, <clears throat> sympathetic noradrenergic failure, the eyelids can look droopy. That's uh, called ptosis. And the pupils can be small. That's called meiosis. And when you measure the blood pressure, there's orthostatic hypotension, a fall in blood pressure between lying down and standing up. So orthostatic hypotension isn't a symptom, it's a sign. Orthostatic intolerance is a, is a symptom. You can have a postprandial decrease in blood pressure. The post-meal lightheadedness, that's a symptom. The postprandial fall in blood pressure, postprandial hypotension, that's a sign. Uh, you can have exercise intolerance, that's a symptom. You can have uh, a failure to increase heart rate appropriately during exercise. That's a sign. So there are many signs and symptoms of sympathetic noradrenergic failure, and they occur in a syndromic way, syndromic. In other words, uh, if, if the doctor is thinking, oh, this patient has sympathetic noradrenergic failure because the person has orthostatic intolerance and orthostatic hypotension, then the doctor should ask about, uh, well, for instance, coat hanger phenomenon, because these things occur together. And, and uh, uh, the syndromic nature of, uh, of this form of autonomic failure helps to, uh, to pinpoint what's wrong. <clears throat> now, the most common cause of uh, sympathetic failure and sympathetic noradrenergic failure is drugs. And uh, unfortunately, people are on numerous drugs, and even experts can't figure out which of these drugs is affecting um, uh, uh, the the patient uh, or, or not. Uh, so uh, there's a whole variety of diseases that will cause uh, sympathetic uh, failure. Some of them are common, like diabetes and Parkinson's, cancer. Some of them are very rare, but the main thing is drugs, and uh, 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 and it can be very difficult to figure out whether the person's uh, uh, sympathetic failure is from a disease or from from uh, a drug treatment. Uh, what about uh, tests for uh, for autonomic failure? Um, uh, <clears throat> the most important, the most important autonomic test is the history. It's not a checklist. Uh, it's uh, a, a it's based on an interview where uh, where the clinician asks questions, the patient answers, and depending on what the patient says, that drives what the the other questions are. So it's it's like iterative. Uh, and the, the history, I'm not going to have time to go into it today, but the history has parts. Uh, the first part is the chief complaint. Uh, what, what's bothering you that's bringing you here today? Not what kind of test did you had, uh, but what are you feeling that, that's bothering you? There's the history of the present illness, and you can read about, uh, 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 read here about what the history of the present illness consists of, it's basically the story. Uh, and the autonomic review of systems is a sort of a checklist. Uh, and it, it's designed, and, and this checklist is designed to query uh, each of the 
components of the autonomic nervous system and each of the chemical messengers of the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> One that's, I think, uh, uh, very valuable for identifying whether orthostatic hypotension is neurogenic. In other words, it's from a failure to, uh, 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 to release norepinephrine from sympathetic nerves, maybe because the nerves aren't there, is, is the Valsalva maneuver. The Valsalva maneuver means you, you blow against the resistance for several seconds and then you relax. And uh, there are characteristic cha changes in blood pressure that happen with the Valsalva maneuver. I'm not gonna have time to go into them, but basically this is a normal blood pressure response. During the maneuver, the blood pressure doesn't go down, down, down. Instead, it's preserved because blood vessels constrict reflexively. And after release of the maneuver, the blood pressure rapidly comes up to baseline and it overshoots because the, the blood vessels have reflexively constricted because of norepinephrine. And if you have failure of the sympathetic noradrenergic system, then the blood pressure goes straight down because uh, during during the during the Valsalva maneuver because the the blood vessels aren't tightening. And after release of the maneuver, the blood pressure slowly comes up to baseline, but it doesn't overshoot for the same reason the person didn't uh, reflexively uh, tighten blood vessels. So uh, we rely on the beat to beat blood pressure response to the Valsalva to determine whether orthostatic hypotension is, uh, is neurogenic. Well, in order to measure B2B -B blood pressure, either you have to have an arterial catheter in, which is uh, kind of invasive, or nowadays you can have a special finger cuff device. It looks a little bit like a mini, mini blood pressure cuff, except it's going around a finger. And, um, and it will record uh, your blood pressure continuously. And I think uh, autonomic centers basically should have this kind of finger cuff system. Now, if you were to, if you were to tilt somebody, and this is an example of what happens when you, when you tilt somebody, uh, here's the blood pressure. You see that in neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, the blood pressure just sort of gradually drifts down and goes to nothing. Uh, and the heart rate importantly, does not increase. This is a sign uh, or a blunted increase in heart rate given the fall in blood pressure. That's a sign of uh, a failure to, uh, a failure of another part of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, so if we go back here, see normally when the blood pressure falls, the heart rate immediately increases. That's uh, the barrow reflex, pressure reflex. Uh, and when, but in this patient, you see the blood pressure is falling more, but the heart rate is not changing. That that's a sign of uh, failure to to uh, a, a, a failure to inhibit uh, parasympathetic outflow, you know, because there isn't any parasympathetic outflow to inhibit. And so you have a barrel reflex sympathoneural failure, that's here. And you have barrel reflex cardiovagal failure, that's here. <clears throat> In centers that, uh, that don't have that finger cuff device, you can't, you can't get this beautiful recording. So you just have blood pressure when you're lying down and heart rate when you're lying down, blood pressure when you're standing up, heart rate when you're standing up. And uh, if there's a large fall in blood pressure and there's no increase in heart rate, that suggests that the, the orthostatic hypotension is neurogenic. There are forms of neurogenic orthostatic hypotension where uh, the blood pressure falls and the heart rate goes up a lot. So uh, if you see this blunted increase, that fits with neurogenic. But if you see an increase in an increase in heart rate, it doesn't rule out neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. You have to do something else to figure out uh, if this was a false negative uh, result. I think in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into uh, 
neurochemistry of uh, of catecholamines, even though I've spent, you know, more than 40 years uh, studying this stuff. But the, all you really need to know is that uh, norepinephrine is stored in sympathetic nerves. It's made in and stored in sympathetic nerves. And in response to nerve traffic, the norepinephrine comes out and you can measure it in the in the bloodstream. <clears throat> Another uh, test which uh, I developed at the NIH and uh, uh, is very powerful is uh, PET scanning. PET scanning is a way to see sympathetic nerves, especially in the heart. So this is an example of uh, a healthy volunteer uh, who had uh, PET scanning uh, with uh, ammonia to uh, to see the blood flow in the heart. That's what this horseshoe is. And this is uh, the fluorodopamine PET scanning, which is to see the sympathetic nerves in the heart. And you can see normally they match up very nicely. In pure autonomic failure, that rare Lewy body disease, where there's orthostatic hypotension, but the person doesn't have signs of Parkinson's, let's say, the, the blood flow is fine. There's the heart. But you don't see the heart at all on this on the on this on the fluid dopamine scan. Very dramatic. In multiple system atrophy, which is that synucleinopathy where uh, it's not a Lewy body disease, uh, uh, you see uh, the perfusion of the heart and you see the nerves. Well, it's a brain disease. The nerves are there. This postganglionic sympathetic nerves are there in most patients. And in Parkinson's with orthostatic hypotension, you see the blood flow is fine. And you don't see the heart at all. Amazing finding. And it's very similar to what you see in pure autonomic failure and completely different from what you see in multiple system atrophy. So this is, I think, a very powerful way to distinguish these two diseases, which clinically are very difficult to separate. Uh, a last technology I want to talk about briefly is uh, skin biopsies. Every hair that you have, every hair follicle has a little muscle. It's called an erector pili muscle. This is what causes your hair to stand up, like if you go out of a, a jacuzzi into a, a cold locker room, let's say. And inside the erector pili muscles, there are, well, they're muscle fibers. That's what's in blue here. And in red, in red is, uh, is catecholamine uh, uh, containing nerve fibers. In other words, these are sympathetic ner noradrenergic fibers. You can see the autonomic nerves. <clears throat> I spent most of my career studying the autonomic nervous system. I never saw sympathetic nerves until this, this, uh, this technology was developed. There are, there's sympathetic innervation of sweat glands and also of blood vessel walls. Um, so there are three sympathetic noradrenergically innervated structures that you can see in a skin biopsy. They're not in the epidermis. That's where the pain sensors are. They're in the dermis underneath uh, the erector pili muscles, the sweat glands, and the, and the blood vessel. <clears throat> I think uh, we're gonna run out of time here, so I'm not gonna go too much into management of autonomic failure. But there's only, th there are three pillars, or three, three stages, I should say, in the management of autonomic failure. It looks like this. The first and most important principle of management is education. Uh, uh, the second uh, uh, is non-drug treatment. And only when you've exhausted these uh, these uh, management uh, uh, strategies do you think about drugs. I know that uh, doctors like to prescribe stuff, but what they really have to do in people with uh, with uh, autonomic failure syndromes is educate them. And how are you going to educate them if you don't know what the <laughs> if you don't know uh, the subject matter yourself? So uh, it's uh, it's a big issue. I'm not going to have time to, to go into what these the education consists of, but I'll just give you one example. If you have orthostatic hypotension and you, and it's neurogenic, <clears throat> and you're a man, 
then don't pee standing up because when you pee standing up, your blood pressure will fall or it can fall. And then you faint or you fall and uh, bathrooms are very unforgiving places. Um, <clears throat> people who have uh, autonomic failure should have a, uh, a medic alert bracelet. Uh, it can just say C wallet. And then in, in the person's wallet, you can have your, you know, your, the details about your condition. But uh, because, because the, uh, the medical uh, educational establishment uh, uh, doesn't involve uh, uh, teaching about autonomic failure, uh, you have to educate the, uh, the, care, the, 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 the uh, emergency medical personnel as well. Um, there are non-drug treatments. Again, I, I, I don't have time to go into them today. And there are drug treatments. And, uh, and all I can say is when it comes to drug treatments, drugs are stupid. And they don't know what position you're in. So it's typical that in people who have orthostatic hypotension and they take a, a drug for, to raise the blood pressure when they're standing up, uh, the blood pressure is too high when they're lying down. It's called supine hypertension, and it's a it's a it's a dilemma. Uh, you can read about uh, about all this stuff. A lot of these slides have been taken from my Principles of Autonomic Medicine e textbook, and you can download it for free from my uh, from my uh, my uh, uh, web page. You just Google me, and uh, and you'll see the the web page. Uh, uh, the in the in the principles of autonomic medicine book, the <clears throat> the text uh, is uh, that's for patients is in large print and uh, sort of light blue, and uh, and you'll you'll see a, a lot of what I've tried to teach here uh, in the principles of autonomic medicine book. I want to thank uh, my my uh, autonomics team. Uh, uh, Jana is our research nurse. Patty uh, does the assays for measuring norepinephrine levels. Uh, Risa is uh, the person who does the beautiful uh, 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 microscopic images of the sympathetic nerves. And Sarah is our, our nurse practitioner who's uh, sort of the one in the pits actually doing the procedures. And I'll uh, and I'll, I'll thank you for your your attention here, and we'll I'm going to stop sharing so we can uh, we can go to uh, questions and.